Did you know that you can watch many of your favorite GLC programs all in one place for free? Just go online at www.glc.us.com and click on the GLC Teachers tab at the top of the homepage. From there you can scroll through dozens of quality GLC video archives containing over 100 full-length programs, updated weekly, and covering topics from Bible teachings and current events to scriptural, financial, and personal health. We've got it all covered at www.glc.us.com, so don't delay, start watching for free today. From Genesis to Revelation, God painted a portrait of the Messiah and His salvation. The Old Testament, given to point to the Messiah. And the New Testament, given as the fulfillment of God's promise of a new covenant to the Jewish people and a light to the Gentiles. Join Richard Booker as he shares the unveiling of the portrait of Messiah, Yeshua, Jesus. As part of the bride, those teachings will help to prepare you for the arrival of the bridegroom, who will soon sound the shofar to announce His coming. Hello friends, welcome to our program today. We're continuing in a series on Jesus and the first century church. You know, many uh, churches, uh, at least the buildings, they'll have a sign out that says, this is a first century church. I don't think so. <laughs> I don't think they really know what a first century church is. And part of that is understanding the very difficult sayings of Jesus. We have to be reminded that Jesus was uh, a Jewish man. Uh, he taught within the context and culture and history of his own people. And when his words are translated uh, from Hebrew and then into Greek and then finally into English in our Bibles, Sometimes some of his statements can be very difficult to understand. Have you ever read some of Jesus' statements in the New Testament and just scratched your head and wondered, what in the world is Jesus talking about? This seems so awkward the way it's worded in English. And so it's a matter of understanding uh, Jesus as an itinerant Jewish Bible teacher. Uh, he taught... Um, with uh, expressions that related to the, to the people of his time. Uh, they were an agricultural people, not an industrial people. And so he used uh, illustrations that were of the earth, of, of the way the people lived and made their living and, and went about their daily lives. And also, <clears throat> during his time, the, the rabbis had uh, certain teaching methods, and Jesus being an itinerant rabbi, he would have used those same teaching methods. And so really, in order to understand some of the difficult words of Jesus, we need to go back and, and learn the ways that he and those around him would have taught during their time. See, he didn't go to our seminaries. So he didn't learn his theology and his doctrine and his teaching methods from Western scholars. But he, he was a Jew of Jews, and he learned to teach within the environment of his own people and the customs and culture of his own people. And so he used figures of speech, uh, what I call Jewish idioms, uh, figures of speech that aren't meant literally but they're expressions to help us understand things. Now, here's a definition that I have that I'd like to share with you about idioms, cultural and generational forms of expression that can only be readily understood by the people of the times. So they're, they're expressions of the people's culture and generation uh, that only those people really can understand. Now, we have many of our own American idioms. <clears throat> and within our own country, we have uh, Yankees who talk certain ways, and uh, folks in California talk different ways. Here in Texas, we have our own Texas talk, and hardly anybody knows what we're talking about unless you're a Texan. Then we have generational uh, communication gaps of people that are uh, getting to be senior citizens like I am. Uh, I don't know what the young people are talking about these days. And when I was a teenager, my parents didn't know what I was talking about. So 
it's very difficult to understand people. Now, let me read over a few of our own kind of American expressions and think about these. They're sort of humorous. Uh, most of us who are a little bit older would know what these phrases mean. Even some of our own younger people may not know what some of these phrases mean. Some of them come from our times when America was an agricultural society. Uh, so some of them don't really fit today. We have now computer geek old buzzwords that uh, are a whole new set of, of terms uh, that people don't know what anybody else is talking about. If you don't talk computer talk, uh, you can be in a whole other world of people. Uh, but think now as I read these, if, if the world continued as it is for another 2,000 years, which, oh God, please no, uh, people 2,000 years ago, they wouldn't have any idea of a lot of things that we're talking about when we use these kind of figures of speech. They'd have to have research teams and scholars and write books and try to explain it all. So, so listen to these now. A, a stitch in time saves nine. Now, young people may not know what that means, but people my age no, because we used to sew up our garments when they were ripped or torn, our clothes. And uh, mother or, or the older daughter, even us guys knew how to sew things a little bit. Uh, stitch in time saves nine. That means you've got to tear in your britches. If you sew it up real quick, you can repair the tear and use those britches again or that dress. But if you don't tend to it, the patch is going to have to be bigger. The hole is going to be bigger. You'll have to use nine stitches rather than one. And so it means take care of the problem while it's a little problem before it gets to be a big problem. It's a kind of a old world way of America's talking of saying these things. Now, here's one. Your eyes are bigger than your stomach. Now, wait a minute. We know that's not literally true. Now, some of us, you know, our, our stomachs are bigger than others, but there's nobody whose eyes are bigger than their stomach. What does that mean? It means, well, you went to the table, you saw all this food with your eyes, and you ate more than you should. Now, we all know what that means, but, you know, 2,000 years from now, would people know what that means? The words leaped off the page into my heart. Okay, that's a strange statement. Words leaping off pages. Can you just see them flying off the pages of the book? Well, we don't mean that literally. I uh, had one of my books, The Miracle of the Scarlet Thread, translated into Japanese one time. And my Japanese interpreter was stuck on this phrase because I used it in the English of the book, leaped off the pages. They didn't have a Japanese word to explain that concept. And I'm not sure if they even had the concept. So we had a lot of fun trying to explain what leaping off the pages means. And uh, here's one, eat your heart out. Ooh, that really sounds gross, doesn't it? Well, we don't really literally mean that. It means be jealous of, of my good fortune. Eat your heart out. Well, can you imagine people 2,000 years from now reading that phrase somewhere? It, it just keeps going. There's so many of these. Uh, don't count the chickens before they hatch. Now, again, that's an old old agricultural phrase in America. Uh, that, that means uh, don't go spend your money before you have it, you know. Or it's raining cats and dogs. Now, that's really a funny one. Have you ever seen it actually literally raining cats and dogs? Well, no. It's a figure of speech. It means it's pouring down. But we know what these things mean ourselves. We don't have to interpret too many of these to ourselves. But uh, if you go to another part of the country, you go to another part of the world, even talk to different generations of people, and you have difficulty understanding their own generational or cultural figures of speech. So now put us back with Jesus. 2,000 years ago, a Jewish man using Jewish figures of speech, that Middle Eastern, they're Semitic, because uh, he's, he's a Jewish man, he's not a Gentile, 
they're, they're cultural, they're generational, they're agricultural. Uh, for Middle Eastern people of 2,000 years ago, and trying to interpret those sayings sometimes through Western seminarian eyes, we can really misunderstand what Jesus was talking about. To really grasp him, we need to understand Jesus, the Jewish Bible teacher. So in this lesson and the next few programs, we're going to be getting into uh, some of his sayings that maybe are a bit difficult for us to understand in our modern times. Now, the first one that I'm going to talk about is one that viewers of prime time know very well. But if you're new to prime time or if you're new to Hebraic Roots, you may not know it that well. It's talked about touching the hem of his garment. Now, again, you old seasoned Hebraic Roots viewers, you know what this is. But your average Christian person really doesn't have an idea. If you have your Bibles, I'd ask you to open it with me to Matthew chapter 9. If you notice, I have a Toledo on, and in a little bit, not right now, but in a little bit, we're going to use it as a teaching tool, uh, and you'll see how this works. Hebrews chapter 9, I'm sorry, Matthew chapter 9. So I'm already thinking Hebraically. Matthew chapter 9, the story of the woman with the issue of blood, a story that most of you know very well. Verse 18 says, While he spoke these things to them, behold, a ruler came and worshipped him, saying, This is a ruler of the synagogue. My daughter has just died, but come and lay your hand on her, and she will live. Now see, this right off disproves the statement that Jews rejected Jesus as the Messiah. Well, of course they didn't reject him as the Messiah. Here's the leader of the synagogue wanting him to come and help him. And so Jesus arose and followed him, and so did his disciples. And suddenly, verse 20, a woman who had an issue of blood, a flow of blood, for 12 years came from behind and touched the hem of his garment. For she said to herself, if only I may touch his garment, I shall be healed or, or made whole. But Jesus turned around and when he saw her, he said, be of good cheer or go cheer up, you know. <laughs> Daughter, your faith has made you well or whole. And the woman was made well or whole from that hour. Now, we know the story here. Most of us who've been believers for a while, we've read this story before. Here's this woman for 12 years. She had this physical problem. She'd gone to all the doctors. They've done all they could do to help her. They can't help her. She doesn't have Medicaid and Medicare. She spent all of her money on, on doctor's fees and prescription drugs, uh, herbal remedies. You know, she's tried it all. Bless her heart. Try to have a little empathy for this woman. Uh, because uh, she has this particular problem. She's been unclean for 12 years ceremonially. Can you imagine? She's an outcast. Yet she heard the master was coming to Capernaum and that he was a healer and maybe he could help her. If she could just get close enough, get out of her house and get out where people are, get into the crowds, press through somehow get close enough. She's heard he's coming close now. He's just a few yards away. If she can reach through all the crowd and just touch the hem of his garment, she could be made whole. This woman was a believer. And because she was able to do that, the Lord healed her and she was made whole. Well, what was this hem of his garment that the woman was so concerned about. And we find in other gospel accounts, it says that they reached out and touched him. Well, you know, we just see this through Western eyes and maybe they somehow patted him on the shoulder or grabbed a hold of his belt or something, you know, or grabbed his tie like Western guys wear. No, this is a Jewish story here. 
And it goes all the way back to the book of Exodus. So we're going to do a little stroll through some Bible verses here. If you have your Bible, we'll go all the way back to Exodus chapter 19. And we'll read a scripture together. You notice I have my Talit on. Uh, because we'll be using this here in a few moments to illustrate the teaching. Exodus chapter 19. This is when God has called the Jewish people, the Hebrews, out of Egypt. And he says to them, Now therefore, verses 5 and 6, If you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be a special treasure to me above all people, for all the earth is mine. And you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words which you shall speak to the children of Israel. They shall be a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. They were to be a royal priestly nation, bringing forth a revelation of the one true God to the nations. Now in Numbers chapter 15, if we can turn over there together, we're going to read some scriptures that relate to this hymn of his garment. Numbers chapter 15, our God is going to tell them to make a garment and put tassels on the end of their garment. So it's Numbers chapter 15 and at verse 37. It says, And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel. Tell them to make tassels on the corners of their garments throughout their generations and to put a blue thread in the tassels of the corners. And you shall have the tassel that you may look upon it, is the way it reads in, in the English, and remember all the commandments of the Lord and do them. Blah, 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 blah. That you may remember and do all my commandments and be holy for your God. So he's, they're going to make a garment here. And I'll hold this up in just a moment and show you. We'll get a close shot on the camera. God tells them to make a garment. It's going to be a four-cornered garment with holes in the, uh, four holes on the, in the edges of the garment. And they're going to make a tassel. Uh, it, it means twisted uh, wool, thread is what it means. That's going to be put in in these four holes. The Hebrew word is tzitzit. And some of you know that word very well. Others may not. You, it's, uh, you, you say the word tzitzit, T-Z-I, tzit, and then T-Z-I-T, tzitzit. And the way you say it is you put your tongue on the top of your mouth uh, towards the roof front, tzitzit, like that, like T, tzitzit. And you say that T-Z-I, T-Z-I-T. You want to practice with me? Tzitzit. Okay, that sounds pretty good. I bet tzitzit. This is the Hebrew word for this tassel. And they're going to to make a, a tassel, a tzitzit, and put it in the four holes or corners of their garment. Now notice it says here that one of these is to be a blue thread. Blue was the color of royalty. Uh, this thread of uh, blue, the blue color, came from a snail that was so expensive it took thousands of these snails just to make a little ounce of this blue dye. And only royalty and priests could wear a garment made of this blue dye. Uh, so they couldn't afford a whole garment made out of this, but they were to have one blue thread. And that blue thread was a witness that they were a royal priest of the Most High God. Now here it says to look upon it and remember and do. The, the Hebrew, though, is better written, look upon him and remember and do. The idea is that when the Jewish men, the Hebrews, obeyed God's word, made this garment, they would look upon it. They were obeying God's word and the presence of God would come up on them. And so, really, the essence of this scripture is really, you're obeying God, I'm going to come and manifest myself. Look, remember, 
and do. It was a visual aid reminding them of the commandments of God, that they were God's covenant people, a royal priest. And if they lived that out, if they looked, if they remembered, and if they did, then God's presence would come upon them. So it's, it's not really looking upon it, but looking upon him. In Jesus' time, they, the, the Jewish men wore a, a simple tunic that came down to about their ankles, and uh, it, it, was, it had a hole for where they would put their head, and it had this deep seat, uh, this tassel in the bottom four corners. Later, uh, over time, uh, this would change. It was their prayer shawl. Uh, and uh, they would wear this tunic uh, in their home, but when they would go out in public, they would put a, another garment over the, over the tunic uh, that would sort of be like their outer clothes. And at the bottom of all this was the, was the it was called their, their, their tallit, and the bottom of it was the tassel of the tzitzit. Later on, as lives changed and styles changed, customs changed and societies changed, it became the prayer shawl, which you know of today. Now, I have here in my hand uh, the tzitzit. Now, this one, unfortunately, does not have a blue thread. It's all white, but we'll tell the story with the time that we have in our lesson today. Uh, God didn't tell them exactly how to do this, so over time, uh, the sages uh, and the religious leaders came up with the idea of making this uh, seat, this tassel, uh, with uh, five double knots. So here we have one here, one, and then they'd have a wrapping of seven wraps. And then the second double knot, they'd have another wrapping of the thread of eight wrappings, a third double knot, another wrapping of 11 wraps. And then this uh, next double knot here, the fourth one, and then they would have a 13 wraps and then a fifth double knot. And then you would have uh, eight strings. It, it's really four, but it's going through both sides. So eight strings. One of these, so here's four and here's four. One of these should be blue as uh, the time we have to talk about it today in our lesson that we will. And so this is the way this would have been made. Uh, very similar in the time of Jesus, but he would not have worn this kind of garment, but he, he would have worn one that was hanging down around his ankles. And this is what this lady, this woman is reaching out trying to touch. We'll see why here in just a moment. Now, God uses pictures to help Jewish people and the Hebrews of old uh, be reminded, see, look, remember, and do. He's, he's the ultimate visual aid person. And so these five double knots and these four wrappings, uh, you have five double knots and, and you have eight threads, so five plus eight is 13. Now, Hebrew words also have numeric value. The word tzitzit uh, has the numeric value of 600. So 600 plus what we have here, five double knots, and eight threads, that's 13, so 613. And many of you would know there were 613 commandments in the Torah of God. So they would look, they would remember, they would do that they are God's covenant people, and they are to keep these 613 commandments of God, not to be saved, but because they were saved, uh, these were the Torah instructions that God gave them for walking with him. Not, not for redemption, but they were redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. But the 613 commandments were given by God to teach them how to walk with him. So, seat 600, five double knots, eight threads, 13. And 13 is the number for echad, which means a unity. So we have also uh, these four wrappings of 7, 8, 11, and 13 equals 26. And 
the, the uh, number 13, Echad, they would look at this. It would be a testimony to them that their God, Yahweh, is one. So this is what the woman was reaching out to touch. Now, why would she do that? In Malachi chapter 4, verse 2, it says, The Son of Righteousness would come with healing in his wings. Now, this word border or outcropping that we see in Numbers, in the book of Numbers, it's also translated into English as wings 67 times. So it means the border, it means the edge, it means the outcropping. And so, according to Malachi chapter 4, 2, that the Messiah would come, the Son of Righteousness, is a Messianic term, the Messiah would come with healing in his wings, in the tzitzit. And so this woman understood that prophecy, and she believed that Jesus was this Son of Righteousness. If I could just touch the hem, the border, the wings... The deceit of his garment, I will be healed and made whole. And that's exactly what she did. And healing power came out of Jesus. He was the son of righteousness with healing in his wings. We'd have to talk more another time about the, the blue thread and the, blue, the dye from the snail. Uh, Jesus came as the representation of all of these things. He was the servant of God that the blue thread represented. And we look upon him and we can find that same healing in our lives today. He's still the son of righteousness with healing in his wings. So I'd encourage you, no matter what you're going through as you're watching the program today, not to reach out and touch some physical garment that Jesus might be wearing, but reach out and, and touch him. Draw near to him and let him draw near to you. And he will bring healing and wholeness into your spirit, into your soul, and into your body. He's still the son of righteousness with healing in his wings. God bless you. Shalom. If you enjoyed this clip, please feel free to check out the full version in the link located in the description panel below. Please be sure to subscribe to our channel. You can also connect with us on Facebook and Twitter. As always, help yourself to the diverse array of teachings located on this YouTube channel or on our website at glc.us.com.